count of three when children open the shoe boxes, they are so excited. Those faces just transform. Yeah, these kids behind me are so excited because they've just received their boxes. The mouth is wide open, the voice is raised, smiles are all over. That box brings joy. We're right now in Phnom Penh in Cambodia. I mean, it's just been incredible. Kids are so excited, giving them a gift, do it in Jesus' name, and that's what this is all about. Jesus loves you. It's a gospel opportunity. It's the chance for the children to change the entire life. That's what I love about Operation Christmas Child. It knows no borders and knows no boundaries. It's all about sharing the name of Jesus Christ. Churches are doing big things with Operation Christmas Child. Everybody out there who packs shoe boxes, they are spreading God's love. It's families, it's churches, it's hundreds of thousands of volunteers that help make Operation Christmas Child so successful. We couldn't do it without them. With this box, they do get the gospel story. They do hear about Jesus. It has maximum impact in the worldwide kingdom of Christ. I mean, what better thing could you do than be involved in fill shoe boxes? Some of them go by train, some go by camels, some go by ships. These boxes go all over the world, and that is only the beginning. After receiving the shoe boxes, the children will be invited to go through the greatest journey, which is a 12-lesson discipleship program where they learn about the greatest gift, which is Jesus Christ. After a child completes the greatest journey, they graduate and receive a Bible in their own language. When the light of the gospel is turned on, that changes everything. Churches are being planted, lives are being changed, communities are being transformed. The word of God is spreading. The gospel is advancing. It is impacting children. It is impacting families. It is impacting the world greatly. Thank you for praying. Thank you for giving. I would like to ask you to consider packing shoeboxes year-round. God will bless, and God will use your gift to touch the life of a child and to be able to do it in Jesus' name. So thank you. Thank you for being a part of it. God bless each and every one of you. You've got 15 days, I think, left to get a shoebox and get it packed and get it back here. Uh, we want to, well, we'd love to break last year's uh, record setting pace, but uh, please, if you can, grab a shoebox. If that's a little hard for you, you can also uh, give to help send those shoeboxes and all of that online, or uh, Samaritan's Purse will pack a shoebox for you uh, someplace. Um, I want to welcome you, first of all, here today to on this beautiful Sunday morning which we get to praise and celebrate uh, our Lord and Savior. I just have a couple of announcements. Let's uh, bow our heads in a word of prayer. Great Almighty God, we humble ourselves this morning as we come into your presence. Father, we ask that your Son, uh, the Spirit, would just touch us and open our hearts to Jesus, that we would worship what you have done uh, for us and continue to do for us, Father. Our hearts are so happy, so glad. And Father, if there's anything that's preventing us from enjoying your presence this morning, may we lay that at the foot of your cross, and come past those outer courts and into the Holy of Holies 
so that you may take that empty cup and fill it with the love and joy and peace that comes and hope that comes from knowing Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Father, guide us through today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let's stand and hear these words from Psalm 62. Please stand. My soul finds rest in God alone. My salvation comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. Find rest, O oh my soul, in God alone. My hope comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. shelter in the time of storm. God doesn't always protect us from removing a storm or detouring around a storm. Often we're in a storm and Jesus is our rock. We take shelter there. 
But what do we do while we're taking shelter and hunkering down? There's something really important we need to remember. Other people are in the storm too. Stuff goes on in other people's lives besides your own. Shock. But we need to remember that. And sometimes we've got the shelter and they do not. They're lost out there in the storm. And so we need to remember to be like the lighthouse that's out in that storm, but is also a beacon for others who may be out there as well. We need to raise our hallelujah. I picture this almost as raising a flag up above the mounds of protection so that someone might see that flag and come to the shelter. And our flag is praise. We don't stand on a soapbox and say, the Lord says and you are. No, we say the Lord is and I am. We raise a hallelujah. God is God and I am safe because of him. So whether you are hunkering down in a storm now, whether you are searching for the shelter, or whether you are basking in the sunshine of blessings in this moment, let's remember, Jesus is a rock in a weary land. He is a shelter in the time of storm, and we need to let others know about it.
There's a wonderful story in <clears throat> the Old Testament where there's a battle going on. And as long as Moses kept his hand up, the Israelites won. But Moses was a man, and he got tired. And when his hand came down, the tides turned, and the Israelites started to lose. So what did they do? The elders came, and they helped prop up the hand. Sometimes in our lives, we need a little help to raise a hallelujah. We need some emotional support, probably not a physical raising of our hand, but we need that kind of help from our brothers and sisters in the Lord. The thing was, when Moses did it, it was visibly obvious what was going on. They could see the hand up. They could see the winning. They could see the hand come down. They could see the losing. Often in spiritual warfare, it's an invisible picture. How do you know? Well, if your hand is tired and you're having a hard time praising, ask somebody to help you. I got a problem. I'm overwhelmed. I'm tired. I can't embrace my suffering I don't see the Lord, glory of the Lord in it. If you share that, others can come and help hold up your hand. Ask. The Bible says, ask, and you will receive. Seek. You will find. You got to know where to go to find the shelter. And we who are not in that storm need to be listening to. As we begin and continue in an attitude of worship to our God, let's make this our prayer to ask for more of what is needed, whether it's love, whether it's the power of the Holy Spirit, whether it's more faith, maybe it's more passion for Christ. Let's make this our corporate prayer today.
We're continuing on in our study in 1 Thessalonians. Wants to be a little slow today in opening up. But we're looking at 1 Thessalonians. We're on chapter 3. We're going to look at verses 1 to 13 today. And Paul's, as he writes to the church in Thessalonica, he writes these words. Finally, when we could stand it no longer, we decided to stay alone in Athens, and we sent Timothy to visit you. He is our brother and God's co-worker in proclaiming the good news of Christ. We sent him to strengthen you, to encourage you, in your faith and to keep you from being shaken by the troubles you were going through. But you know that we are destined for such troubles. Even while we were with you, we warned you that troubles would soon come, and they did, as you well know. That is why when I could bear it no longer, I sent Timothy to find out whether your faith was still strong. I was afraid that the tempter had gotten the best of you and that our work had been useless. Paul goes on to write, but now Timothy has returned, bringing us good news about your faith and love. He reports that you always remember our visit with joy and that you want to see us as much as we want to see you. So we have been greatly encouraged in the midst of our troubles and sufferings. Dear brothers and sisters, because you have remained strong in your faith, it gives us new life to know that you are standing firm in the Lord. How we thank God for you. Because because of you, we have great joy as we enter God's presence. Night and day we pray earnestly for you, asking God to let you see you again to fill the gaps in your faith. May God our Father and our Lord Jesus bring us to you very soon. And may the Lord make your love for one another and for all people grow and overflow. Just as our love for you overflows. And may he also result, um, may he as a result make your hearts strong, blameless, and, and holy as you stand before God our Father when our Lord Jesus comes again with all his holy presence. Amen. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Great God in heaven. We thank you again for your word. And as we approach your word today and as we look at faith that lasts, Father, may you open our eyes to the places where we need to grow in our faith, where we need to become stronger. May we learn from Paul and may we learn from the Thessalonians, O oh Lord, on how to strengthen our faith in you. Father, I pray that the words that I speak this morning would be the words that you would have me to say, not my choosing, but your choosing. And we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. Does distance uh, truly make the heart grow fonder? Well, back in my younger days, um, which unfortunately are getting to be further away than they once were, um, when Olive and I were uh, late in our, in our, in our teens, uh, I think she was probably 19 and I was 18, or I was 19 and you were 20 at the time, but Olive went off to uh, Guelph to study uh, at the university, and uh, as you may know or may not know, Olive and I have grew up together in, in the church. Our family used to take her the church every Sunday, and my mom used to call her the daughter at one time that she didn't have. Now, mom has two daughters, but she's the oldest daughter, I guess, in that case. Um, her mom and dad, of course, were married uh, by my grandfather, 
who was a pastor, had married her mom and dad. But anyway, to make this story get it back to being shorter, um, <laughs> of course, when she went off, we were good friends and started getting close together. But when she left and went, there was this sense of, of separation, right? And, and the heart started uh, longing for each other. So by the time she graduated, some three years, four years later, um, we were getting married in the spring of that year. Not knowing can be the hardest part of separation. Not knowing what your friend is doing. And of course, back in those days, uh, unlike the today, you couldn't text and phone. Like to phone her would have been long distance and was a lot of money. Um, and stuff. So you can imagine, we even wrote letters or drew pictograms I did for her as uh, my mother wrote the letter and I wrote the pictogram of what, we, what I was doing. But anyway, hearts long for each other when we are separated. And we can see this here where, where Paul is cut off from uh, his beloved church and most of Paul's letter uh, where he is not able to be there in that particular church. We see Paul's longing. He, he knew what, what they were up against. He knew the struggles that the Thessalonians were going to have and he feared for them. Would they think that Paul had sold them some bill of goods and disappeared? Would they abandon the faith to, to save their lives? Paul wrote in verse 5, he said, That is why when I could bear it no longer, I sent Timothy to find out whether your faith was still strong. Paul was worried that they had, were going to leave the faith, though they were such babes in the Lord. I was afraid that the tempter had gotten the best of you and that our work had been useless. So Paul sent Timothy, right? Timothy, his closest friend and confidant uh, in work, to find out what's going on, what had happened to this church. Were they still faithful to God or, or what? And fortunately, he got good news. They had kept the faith. They still liked Paul. He was still in favor with them. And there's something for us to learn in these passages about our own faith, what we should look for in our own faith, what you should look for, what we as a church need to look for in our own faith. One of the first things that we need to look for is a faith that that can endure trouble. Because whether you believe it or not, trouble is coming. Paul wrote, and and to keep, in verse 3, he said, and to keep you from being shaken by the troubles you were going through. We talked a little bit about that in the past, and we'll talk more about that in the future messages. But you know that we are uh, destined for such troubles, that trouble is going to happen. Real faith will attract trouble. If your spiritual life, people, is placid, And uneventful, it may be fake. The saying is, if you don't meet Satan head on every morning, you're probably going in his direction. Trouble is there. Trouble is there. Real Christianity is a lightning rod as we are all starting to experience for persecution. But real faith, the faith that lasts, stands firm, stands firm in spite of everything else. Graham Staines uh, and his family answered God's call to missionary, be missionaries in, in India. He and his two sons uh, visited a city and slept in their car while doing their mission work again mission work is not glamorous work except in the fact that we're serving the Lord right 
It was a time of turmoil for different religious groups, and Christians became a particular target for those groups. And while he and his sons were sleeping in the car, uh, a mob surrounded the missionary car, and they set it on fire. And Graham and his two sons burned to death. Gladys Staines uh, was left all alone in a strange and hostile land. And the question is, what did she do? Well, she sets an example for all of us. She went on TV and openly forgave the murderers of her husband and the two young children. Her action pierced the hearts of millions in India. Because you see, Hindus see forgiveness of such a brutal brutality as a sign of true spirituality. And they find it very appealing. As Lee was talking about in his stories, it's a door that opens. India is not alone, of course, in this. Many in Canada are looking for true spirituality. They are looking for truth that that is lived out with conviction, passion, and changed lives. Those who live it must, of course, be prepared for the price that it costs. After the murder of her husband and the two sons, Gladys said, the thought of getting up and leaving had just not occurred to me once she said I just feel that this is where God has called me to be a question for you today is could your faith survive tragedy could it survive a tragedy I don't wish one on you but will your faith survive it You see, anyone can believe when it works. The best faith, of course, comes out of the hardest experiences. Oh, it's easy when we go to church and we can sing lots of songs and we can have great praise and we can have a great show and all of that stuff. But when we get out in the trenches and people are criticizing you for being a Christian, telling you you're racist, you're homophobic, you're all these names that we could kick out there. Does your faith survive? We need to ask God to give you, you do, we need to, as a church too, to ask God to give us the strength to hang on, to overcome the trials and tribulation. Of course, his word tells us he will. Our faith should be a faith that is characterized by joy, too. In verses 7 to 9, it says, So we have been greatly encouraged in the midst of our troubles and suffering, dear brothers and sisters, because you... Remember, Paul is going through trials and tribulations, too. Because you have remained strong in your faith. He was encouraged. In his trials, well, here, I, this group is still strong. They're still living out the, 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 the faith that we had taught them. It gives us new life to know that you are standing firm in the Lord and how we thank God for you. Because of you, we have great joy as we enter into God's presence. As I said, their faith encouraged Paul. And you see, when we hang on, when we encourage others to hang on, when we don't give up our faith, we encourage others not to give up theirs. There is comfort in knowing that others share our convictions, that others are sharing our experiences. Their faith uh, brought the apostle Great joy. Great joy. You you see, being a Christian 
is blessed. Christians are blessed people. We may not always feel blessed, but we are. We are blessed. We have Jesus Christ. We have the power and the strength. Our attitude can rise above our circumstances because our destiny, people, our destiny is secured. We have a home in heaven, in the new heaven and the new earth. which is beautiful beyond any of our comprehension. You are not just living for yourself as the world keeps trying to tell us and as I see Christians buying into that it's all about me. Well, it's not. We are having an impact on others, either a good impact or a bad one. But your life impacts all those around you. You can't live without impacting somebody. We need to have a faith that has room to grow. Paul wrote in verse 10, night and day we pray earnestly for you, asking God to let us see you again, to fill the gaps in your faith. Now, gaps in your faith here does not mean... um, that they didn't believe in, they weren't Christians or that they didn't believe in Christ. Faith here is not an initial commitment to Jesus, but living out the faith every day. They may have had a hint of the initial understanding of salvation. It might have been lacking, but that's not really what Paul's getting at here. They need to have their faith Strengthen. Paul thinks he can, he can bring that faith up by visiting them, by encouraging them, by continuing to teach them, by taking them from the milk and bringing them into the meat of, of the word of God, of who God is. They see they still have, and as you and I do, they still had more to learn, more to do. See, Christians don't ever arrive until they're glorified, until we get to that new heaven and that new earth. Until then, our faith can always grow. The sad thing, it can also shrink. It can become stagnant, stale. question you need to ask yourself this morning is what is lacking in your faith what are you lacking what are your areas of weaknesses or ignorance and what are you doing about it what are the trends in your spiritual life see too many Christians today are stagnant and satisfied to be so in their life. I encourage you, don't be one of them. Don't be one of them. You need to continue to grow. You need to get into God's word, and you need to hang out with other brothers and sisters in the Lord, doing the work of the Lord throughout the land, whether it's here in Dunville or some other place. You need to do God's work. And we need to have a faith that that loves more and more. Paul wrote, and may the Lord make your love for for one another and for all people grow and overflow just as our love for you overflows. Remember back when uh, Paul is praising them because he's heard about them elsewhere, the faith of the Thessalonians? Love is the ultimate sign of a genuine Christian. Love for each other. We should have love for each other. Love for our brothers and sisters in Christ. There should be a closeness among Christians. It should grow and increase. It should have an overflowing quality that others notice. Do they notice our love at First Baptist? And we should have love for everyone else. G. 
Jesus says love for families and friends is expected, but love for outsiders and enemies is exceptional. Who is the hardest person that you have loved or have to love, need to love? Love doesn't mean we give in to sin or any of that stuff. Love means we want to see that person come to salvation, to Jesus. Love means as a family that we want to strengthen each other, that we want to sharpen each other, that we want to learn from each other uh, the truths of Jesus Christ. And finally... We need to have a faith that is strong enough to last until Jesus comes back. Is your faith that strong? Paul wrote, may he, as a result, make your heart strong, blameless, and holy as you stand before God, our Father, when uh, when our Lord Jesus comes again with all his holy people. People, our personal morality, our integrity matters. It matters. It matters so much because Jesus is coming again. Perhaps real soon. Could be as early as tonight. Don't think it is, but it could be as early as tonight. The question that we need to ask ourselves, do we have faith? Or will we be ready for him to come? Or are we still sitting back saying, oh, I got lots of time. I got lots of time. There's a song that was written back, I think in 67, if I remember right, 68. I actually sung at Woodstock by Larry Norman. Uh, Probably a lot of us came more in contact with it when DC Talk sang the same song uh, in the 90s. But let me read you these words because people, are you ready? Life was filled with guns and war. Sounds like today, doesn't it? It was true back in 67 and 68 and so on for those of us that were alive back then. And all of us got trampled on the floor, Norman wrote. I wish we'd all been ready. Children died and days grew cold. A piece of bread could buy a bag of gold. Seems possible today, doesn't it? I wish we'd all been ready. There's no time to change your mind. The sun has come, and you've been left behind. A man and wife asleep in bed. She hears a noise and turns her head. He's gone. I wish we'd all been ready. Two men walking up a hill. One disappears, and one's left standing Still, I wish we'd all been ready. There's no time to change your mind. The sun has come, and you've been left behind. Children died, the days grew cold. A piece of bread could buy a bag of gold, and I wish you'd all been ready. There's no time to change your mind. The sun has come, and you've been left behind. The father spoke. The demons died. How could you have been so blind? Are you blind? There's no time to change your mind. The sun has come, and you've been left behind. It goes on to repeat, I hope we'll all be ready. You've been left behind. I hope we'll all be ready. You have been left behind. I hope we'll all 
be ready. You have been left behind. Where's your faith? Is your faith truly in Jesus Christ, our Lord? Because if it's not, you'll be left behind. Doesn't matter how good of a person you've been. Doesn't matter what the world says is the way to go or that there are many gods or all of those things. There's only one God. There's only one way to heaven, and that is through faith in Jesus Christ. But you don't want to just keep it there. You want to grow that faith in Jesus Christ. And our calling that Jesus gave us in the Great Commission is to go and make disciples, other followers, other believers in Jesus Christ. If you're a Christian, that's your call. It's not to stand there and say, oh, I wonder when he's coming. No, it's to go and tell others about Christ because if I know Jesus I've got a place in heaven a home a home we're told that outshines the sun Uh, a mansion rooms depending on what translation you want to talk about I remember listening to some guy talk about heaven uh, and talk about the mansion he said it's kind of like when uh, you know the settlers would come and they built this house Except in God's case, this house. And then they would add on the room for the family, right? For the next couple and the younger generation and another one and another one and another one. I always thought that was a great, I guess it's because I grew up in the country in the farm, but I thought it was a great thing that we're family. And as your pastor, I don't want any of you left behind. So put your faith, put your faith in Jesus, not in what the world says, not in what you're being taught in the school or being uh, taught by the media or whatever the case is, or being told this is what you got to believe because that's what's going on in the world today. We've got to believe this, not this. God forbid they would say that you follow what scriptures have to say. We need a faith that matters. And as I read about this Thessalonian church and what excited Paul so much is that he, he hadn't been there for a while and yet it had grown and God had worked in it and they were excited still about Jesus. When you think back to 100 and almost 40 years, I think now, at the, this church, people were excited when they built this. Can you, Just imagine what it must have done for people who built this sanctuary. This is the first part that they built, guys. That's why I say that. They were excited because they were going to be able to have a place to to worship God and then to share him. They came here, the, the pastors and stuff, because of the canal, and they wanted to share with those rough workers and those people who didn't know Jesus. They wanted to share it. That's our history. And we need to... Continue it. We need to continue it. Because we don't want anybody left behind. God doesn't really want anybody left behind, except he knows there will be, because they will choose not to choose him. But let's not be the reason that they don't choose Christ. Let's live for him. Let's live with integrity and morality and let's live sharing the gospel of Jesus let's bow our heads in prayer as we close today great God in heaven we've been so blessed as a church we could sing the old song I am so blessed I don't understand but Lord God In that blessing, sometimes, Father, we have to say we haven't allowed ourselves to continue to be excited about you. We've just taken our faith for granted. We haven't lived it out. Worse yet, we've allowed it to to go backwards instead of forward.
We spend more time worrying about things that the world tells us that we should worry about than the spiritual health of individuals, oh Lord. Father, forgive us. I pray for myself and everyone here, Lord, that we would strengthen our faith, that we would encourage each other as well as others outside of these doors, and that we would share that faith with those around us and around the world, that we would be ready for the coming of the Lord. For when the trumpet sounds, we would be ready. Father God, we ask this in Jesus' name. And I ask you speak to each person's heart. Because I can't do it for them. They need to surrender to you. I know you will help, but they need to make that choice. Father, help us to make that choice. And we pray for people who we know are friends or family or whatever who haven't yet made that choice. And we pray today that they too would come to Jesus because of our faith in you. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And now may the grace of God, which passes all of our understanding, May the love of God touch each and every one of our souls from this time forward and forevermore. May God bless you in Jesus' name.